three. Thank you, Tracy. So Peter is Peter's family, and I, I, I don't claim any privilege by saying that because he's created family uh, up and down the Northeastern corridor across the country and across the Atlantic and Pacific through his architectural magic. Um, my, um, Peter is, I mean, first and, and foremost for today, you should know, I think that Peter is a trustee. So he, he watches over the school in a formal and technical, uh, legal manner. And he's also somebody who in a very direct and explicit way has also built the school. Um, you've all read his biography and it's formidable. Um, Ivy League trained uh, and has done work, as I said, basically across the planet. And not only is an amazing architect, but just a wonderful, wonderful teacher. And that takes me, gives me great pride to, to say that as a teacher, um, that Peter has not only mastered his craft, which involves a unity of the head and the hand and the heart, but he's also able to share that, that artistry and that technical prowess with countless architects around the globe. Um, uh, Peter, for my purposes, I just wanna say Peter, and I told him this before, I told him this on his, on, on his 50th birthday not too long ago, maybe it was 80th, I can't keep track. Mm -hmm. But uh, Peter taught me that, that um, and Peter taught me that beauty lies, and this I'm quoting, and, and Peter knows the quotation because he's heard it decades before I did. Peter taught me that beauty lies not in the thing itself, but in the patterns of shadow, the light and the darkness that one thing against another creates. Um, Peter also, and maybe he'll talk about this, but he tore down my childhood home. With my, with my express permission. We had a parade of the best architects in the city and in, in the world come through and uh, Peter smashed that beauty contest um, and basically said, either you wanna work with me or you don't wanna work with me. And he told us about uh, and showed us the beauty of design build. He actually, when I was a little doubtful because I was dazzled and never really thought uh, specifically about lived space, he actually took me on the road and brought me up to see a, 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 a lumin. Well, I saw one school in the Bronx and I said, ah, Peter, this is all right. And he's like, okay, wise guy. And we got in his car and uh, we drove up uh, to see a beautiful synagogue that just sang to my heart. For, so from school to synagogue uh, to library, Peter has done it all and he's done it all for us. So we, you know, I trusted him to, to smash down my childhood home and he built something that was way more beautiful um, and something that I could have, we could have never dreamed of. And I happen to have the pleasure of sitting in that space right now. Peter is, um, he's quite direct and he's quite scientific and he's, he's, he's uh, quite lapidary in his choice of language. And he is a magician with steel and glass, Peter frames, truly the infinite. He frames space and then he shapes light from our star. And that's what we get to experience every time we walk in this building. He created a place conducive to serenity, virtue, and joy, which are our framing virtues here. Um, and, you know, Peter in the, in the green room, as he's, he's so wise and you know, these things just flow from all the time. But he, he said that um, there's also a political meaning to a building. And in this time of, of Black lives and political unrest, you know, I think back to discussions that Peter and I had probably starting 15 years ago about the political meaning and presence of uh, what the political meaning of the presence of this beautiful building that he was going to build would mean for our community. And we, we spoke for 
for uh, spoke many times and over a period of no months about the uh, political urgency of having a, a, the best of buildings for black and brown lives and for immigrant lives. And um, here I am to, to tell the tale um, in, um, in- Can you hear in, me, uh, Ivan? Yeah, Peter, give me a second. In, 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 a, in a matrix of, of light and shadow that Peter has created. So it is my pleasure, my honor to teach, to introduce the great teacher, architect, humanitarian, Peter Gluck. You're on, Peter. Thank, thank you. I, I wanted to just uh, pick up for, for a second on what you, you, you were talking about. And that is um, one, of the, one of the real, real um, let's say issues we had between us <laughs> is that um, Ivan was sure and worried that the building was gonna be desecrated by the folk in the, in the neighborhood. And we had this big uh, uh, discussion about whether we should have basically a, a, a gate so that at nighttime, we, the gate would come down in front of the building and keep, keep people from sleeping up on the, on the, the, uh, the uh, ramp and peeing in the building and on the building and all that sort of thing. And I said, no, 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 that's the, we're, we're, not, we're not taking a defensive position here, we're taking a positive pos uh, position, and if if the building is good and, and the, the the works going on within the building are good, the community will respect it and will protect it. And Ivan, maybe you should explain a little bit what what is who was right. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is in the question. <laughs> yeah, that's not fair, is it? Not um, really, but I'll accept it. <laughs> Anyway, I you know I was I was um, being um, optimistic, but but I, I think hopeful and and believe that 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 my position was correct, and I think that it, it has been proven. Uh, this is not a contest between Ivan and me by by any means, but but I think that's true. I think that the part of the story of the building is that it is of the community by the community, and and it has in many instances been literally protected by the community. And, and that to me um, is, is a true sign of um, its value, uh, more so than the awards because it's pretty or people, or people can place it in, 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 in a kind of uh, lineage of, of architectural history. Um, that to me is the most important part that it has become a, a part of, of the community and, uh, and, and looks to, to a positive future for the community, which is what, what could be more so than, than a school. So, um, yeah, so anyway, what I'd like to do today, uh, we probably don't have enough time and I always talk too much, but um, I have a bunch of, of slides when talking about architecture, it's, it's a huge subject. So I don't know how you, in, in 50 minutes or 40 minutes to talk about architecture. But I'll sort of dive in and just kind of shoot in at, 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 at a couple of places that might be, um, might explain some of the aspects of architecture and some of the aspects of, of being an architect. Uh, I can talk more about being an architect later, maybe in the questions. But why don't I start with some of the slides I have? That sounds great. Um, Bethia, I think if you have the slides, you should be able to share your screen. Hi, Bethia. Hi. <laughs> Is Bethia still there? I'm here. I'm um, actually, we're going to do it from Peter's computer. Okay. So if you can make him co-host, that'd be great. Oh, sure. Let me do that. One second. Okay. Okay. So he's a co-host now. Okay. Oh. Hopefully we can figure this out. <laughs> that's that's the first slide, so that's that's good. Hold on, we're not sharing it. Okay, we're gonna say share. I have to explain that I can't even send an email with this damn thing. <laughs> <laughs> this Another thing Peter and I have in common. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we should be sharing now. I think Peter, you need to press view on the top right. Okay. And then presentation, go down. 
Yeah. Ask to unmute. This yeah, we can hear you. Okay. No, you're good. Are we all right now? Yes, looks great. Okay, so um, imagine what this is. This is your site. And this is where Ivan's house was. Ivan, was it this, 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 uh, it wasn't this uh, lot, it was the next one? That was yeah, your... it was the tenement building. Yeah, yeah, third floor. Right, which, um, wait a minute now, I, I'm having, uh, Bethia, somehow I've covered up where I can go forward. Is Bethy still there? Let's see. I think she is. I'm here. I'm just muted. <laughs> oh, she's times. just ignoring us. <laughs> I, have, I, um, have no, I have no way to move forward. Uh, press the page up and down. This is probably in the okay, early 90s, Peter. Oh, who? Got it? Yeah, there it is. I think this must be your house, Ivan. Yeah, there I am in the rubble. Well, you will be. There you are in the rubble. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think of this, folks? And, and, and look at Ivan. They're too scared to comment, Peter. <laughs> no. So we found this uh, in, the, in the rubble, which we, we found pretty, pretty funny, actually. <laughs> um, so. I'm going to talk a little bit about about structure and how buildings, so that when you when you look at buildings, you be, you'll begin to understand a little bit about what happens. But but your building is actually in the floodplain, which means that water can come in a storm all the way up to the street level, which means that the space that you're in now is below would be actually in the water. So that's why we need to have the, these long, if you look at these long skinny things, those are piles which go down deep into the ground and have to be driven into the ground to deal with the fact that the, the, the building is, is going to float. So those poldings, those piles don't, the, the weight of the building is not on those piles. That's not the problem. The problem is that when the, the water floods, the, your your um, gymnasium would float like a boat, would pop right out of the ground unless we held it down, which is, is kind of, I, I really like counterintuitive things because it makes you think, uh, and, and there's definitely a counterintuitive uh, principle going on here. And those are the piles that get driven into the ground. And these, these are the, the um, reinforcing for the concrete that, that makes the boat. And all that white paper is, is not paper, it's all pl plastic, which waterproofs that space. So you see this kind of thing all around the city. And the, the question is, what is it for? What is, what is all that stuff? And so I'm, there you can see how, how below, below grade it is and how this is a big boat that we're building underneath our building, which you're, you're in the boat right now. There's the boat and that's where you're sitting in the boat. So that's where, if you look at the glass, uh, looking into the backyard, that that the bottom of the glass is the level of the flood. Another thing that um, we did, um, these are huge, huge beams, much bigger than you would need for, for a school building your size. But what we did is we placed them and Ivan and, and the, um, the board of the school didn't know what we were doing, but we we bought this huge beam and, and put it in the front of the building so that in the future, if we have to change the walls because the pedagogy has changed, now, now we, we work in a certain way, we have classrooms. It's very possible in the future, we won't, we won't have the same um, structure for teaching. And when that happens, it'd be very easy to strip out the walls without having to do anything structural. So this was something we added that may or may not ever be use, useful in the future, but I have a feeling that some day somebody will, say, somebody will say, look at this, how did this happen? Um, and, and I'll be happy and, and I'll be rolling around in my, in my wood box, um, being happy that some of the things that we thought about um, would actually come to be helpful in the future. 
So one of the things about a, a building is it's not static. It's always changing, it's always moving because systems are always improving, things, things have to be repaired, things are added to. So we try to think about what's going to happen in the future with our buildings. They're, they're, like, they're like animals uh, that, that need, need uh, and, and live over time, a long time actually. If, if they're valued, they'll, they'll last even longer. Um, so let's talk about those, um, those re rebar. They're called re all those, those long, thin metal pieces, steel pieces. If you understand that this principle that's being shown here, you'll really understand almost all you really need to know about structure. It's that simple. But, but when you go to school, you don't, you, this is not the way they, they teach. But um, this, if, let's, let's look at the top diagram, which is the beam. And of course, the small wrestler is, is um, the load or the weight of the people and the, the materials that it takes to make the building. And what in the, the bottom picture is the actual beam itself. So when the load is applied on the top where you see those arrows pointing in, that's all in compression. So if that's concrete, concrete is really good. You can't squeeze it. But at the bottom, so, so that the top of the beam gets shorter and the bottom of the beam gets longer. So to keep the bottom of the beam from getting longer, you use the steel. So if you look at the, the, the little box on the right, this is the way a, a, a beam looks when you cut it and looking at, at the section of it. The bottom, those little round things on the bottom are the steel. That's the bottom cord of the, of the beam. And on the top, it's in compression, it's pushing. It's trying to, trying to get smaller. So that's the way it works, it's that simple. And that's why you see all that, that steel everywhere. And, and, and that's the principle that, that takes care of probably 90% of, of structural analysis. So, so it, everything that looks complicated, really, if, if you look at it properly, can, can be reduced to something, something that's really quite simple. And once you know these simple principles, uh, the whole world opens up in terms of what your understanding is. I think that's kind of a, a, a learning principle. The, the more you know, the more, the more things that are com completely opaque become transparent to you. And to, to me, that's always been a principle that, that, that uh, um, I think is critical, is, is being observant and understanding the way things work whether it's physical or whether it's social or whether it's the way, the way people react to each other, the more you can, the more you can understand these principles, simple, simple principles, the more you can, can get a handle on what, what um, society and life is all about. There you see these, these reinforcing bar, bars uh, tied together, they, those bumps on them be, uh, so that they won't slide through the concrete. Because remember, they're being pulled apart by the, by the load that's on the top of the, of the floor or the beam. I don't know if that's too complex, but um, I, I, I thought that would be interesting to, to th th think about. Another aspect of, of designing is not only the, not only the structure, how, how it holds up and, and, and what it's doing physically, but, but what, what is happening so societally or socially inside the building? Here, here's a group of people trying to plan a building, determining what the spaces are. So each one of these little blue boxes it is a, a room or a function within the, within the building that somehow has to be determined. Um, before you can design a building, you, you must know what it's for. So this is these are little boxes that, that indicate the program or what the build what the all of the spaces that are going to be in the building. Once you've done that, uh, let me see. Yeah, here's, here's the, that's what happens. So if you take all those boxes and how do you how do you fit them in that that theoretical um, uh, ex exterior of the building? And, and that's that's where a huge amount of, uh, of focus and, and interest is, is, is placed it, it, because each room has its own desire. The art room wants to be fantastic and large and beautiful. The science room wants to be the same. 
the stairways create a certain amount of demand for space. The cap every every space is like that. It's like a giant battle inside that that uh, clear box, and and to, to manipulate those and determine which has precedence and which position is is a, a vastly complicated but extremely interesting process of of early early design of a building. This is another building that, that ultimately had been been uh, the spaces had been not only identified but then then placed in relation to from one to the other. <clears throat> so how, how does the building look and what is it, what is it, its expression on the outside? Here here we have if you look at the left side you, you see the pixelated facade. Ivan wanted the classrooms to feel like they were protected. The, the, the relationship between the school and its learning and the individual learning uh, as opposed to the common good, the, the kind of social, um, the, the social needs uh, of the building. So the, 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 the screen is what he, he had a, a vision of the classrooms being screened from the community but the, the lower portion of the building uh, where the public spaces are, cafeteria and so forth being, being um, more open, more visible to the community. So the, I see it's, okay, so this, this is the kind of, screens that, that I think Ivan was uh, initially thinking about. This is from the, you know, from Islamic architecture, but, but where, where that, that's a, a, a major element in the design of, of these buildings is the screening um, of the space for, for light and air and for protecting the views within uh, a different culture, a different expression of the facade of a building. This is, a, this is um, a public space with, a, with a, again, a very different expression, a much more open, um, much more inviting uh, expression of, of the exterior of, of, the, of the building. And then, and then we were trying to think of how could, what would the pattern be if we were to do that, the, the screen, what would be a, a, a screen that would be, make sense in this context, in, in uh, up your street on 100, 103rd Street. This is a, a weaving by Annie, Amer Annie, Al um, Annie Albers, um, mid-century 1950s, that seemed to be appropriate for what the facade of the building might be. And we, we took this as an inspiration for the, for the, and here you see the facade with the screen on the top and the glass being the uh, more, more um, open social communal use of the building, being mostly the cafeteria and the entrance. And, and that's what developed the, the uh, expression, the expression, as I was talking about initially, not style, but expression as it, it comes from within the building. And we wanted it to, to, to change, not be static, so we chose materials that that that, look, that act differently at different times of day with di different uh, quality of light on them. We also thought about the fact that this would allow us to make every window exactly the same, which would which would be a, a huge difference in cost, rather than having a list of, of you know forty different kinds of windows and having to keep track of all of that. It costs more money than if you say, okay, I want eight hundred windows exactly alike. So, so at the same time, we're thinking about all these, um, what would you say, conceptual issues. We're also thinking of, of, of money because the, the, the limitation to everything is how much money we have. And we're always fighting the budget. We never have enough money. Uh, we think we never have enough money. If we actually think hard enough, we probably do have enough money. In fact, we saved money on this building. We spent less than we had anticipated we would. Part of you know, the, the kinds of thinking uh, like the fact that all of the windows are exactly alike, which you never would think about when you're in the building. Why are the windows all the same? 
And then once you, you develop the idea of the screen and of the, of the pieces that are, that are relatively uh, comparable to the way the rest of the street has been divided up, um, we have many different studies, different colors to determine what we think um, w w is the most appropriate. So this is a, a, a huge study to get to where we actually wound up. And we are using, I, I should have said that, showed this before, we're, we're using um, the, the size and scale of the, of the build, windows in the building, even though we flip them and use them in different directions. This is what would make, makes the building, although it's very different from its neighbors, this is what makes the building contextually fit in, in that streetscape. Now let's talk a little bit about style um, because I think that was one, one of the first questions that was asked and something that always interests um, people is what, is what is a traditional building and what is a modern building? So this is, this is um, a, a Greek building um, and it is the basis of most traditional architecture is Greek and Roman architecture. That's, that, that is our, our kind of Western heritage. So the buildings that are designed like this, and, and we see them mostly public buildings, um, they're older buildings and they're, they're um, aggressive, I would say, and they, they represent, they're so expensive that they represent power they represent the kind of central institutions uh, of society. Whereas when we, when we get to the modern or more contemporary wor world, let me see if I can, what am I doing here? Somehow it switched. Uh, sorry, Peter, go back up to that view let me, let on the top this. right. Yeah, I, I got it. Okay. Um, these are these are traditional buildings from different different uh, different cultures. So, so the, 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 this is um, Turkey and definitely different culture. But you can see there's a similarity in terms of of the of the solidity, the massiveness, the the um, in, in a way, display display of of, of um, money, the display of wealth, and and the, the expression of of control. Uh, that's the political aspect of, of from from my position. Uh, we we started the, the the whole modern modern movement, which was meant to be I'm going the wrong way. So I'm just showing a, a couple of modern buildings here. And the difference, uh, it, it's really hard to, I, I can't get into explaining too much about this, but I think just the, the look of these, these buildings, one next to the other gives you an idea. This is a glass house in Connecticut. Uh, and then this is the kind of, um, kind of common pastiche that, that exists uh, where, where people sort of want the, the memory of those kinds of buildings. Uh, so those are the, the kind of gable ends, those triangles. They, they have no meaning whatsoever. They're just kind of glued on the face of the building. And the only meaning they have is, 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 a, is a kind of um, romantic notion of how great the past was uh, in, in a kind of a very, very simple and, and, and many times kind of a brutal present. Um, anyway, I'll stop there and, and uh, it's an awful lot to, to gobble up. So I'm ready for questions. I'm sure there are some. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Peter. That was so wonderful. And, and we do have plenty of questions. Um, should we maybe stop sharing screen, Bethia, if you're able to do that? And we'll- I think. Uh, I think Peter has to press it. Peter, the red button, stop share at the top. Can you just click that? 
Perfect. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, and we'll go to our first question. It comes from- I can, I can be trained. That's really great. <laughs> uh, Catherine has a question for you. So she'll start us off first. Hi, good morning. Morning, how are you, Catherine? I would like to thank you for being- Oh, I'm good, thank you. And I would like to thank you for being our virtual speaker today. And throughout time, architecture has evolved in tremendous ways Sometimes older buildings are taken down to make way for more modernized buildings, and many people believe that this is a mistake. My question for you is, from an architect's point of view, should we always replace older style buildings with new and improved architecture styles? Why or why not? Yes. <laughs> well, there, there, are, there, there are reasons to preserve buildings. Um, buildings of, uh, of, of any epoch kind of uh, responding to the needs of that particular time in that particular community are excellently done and become, become um, important buildings because of the way they were designed and, 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 and they, they, they need to be preserved. We need to preserve our past so that we can understand our, our future and our present. But there are a lot of buildings that, and most buildings have no particular um, artistic and, and cultural value. So the idea of keeping old buildings just for the sake of keeping old buildings, I, I think is um, not a good idea. Um, also making new buildings is, is the, the idea is to um, maybe in, increase the housing. So if you, if you, if you preserve, a whole lot of old buildings, you, you, you don't have room for, for building the, the kinds of buildings we need in today's society. And the most important one, of course, being affordable housing, which we talk about all the time. So there's often a conflict between knocking buildings down to build affordable housing or uh, preserving the buildings uh, and, and not having any, any new housing for people to live in. Great, thank you so much. We'll go to our next question. Um, it comes from Vanessa. Hi, good morning. I read in your biography that you lived and worked in Tokyo only early on in your career as an architect. My question for you is, what are the main differences between the architecture styles that are commonly found in Japanese cities and the styles that we typically see throughout American cities? Mm, um, good question. I think the, 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 first, the first thing, the first the major difference between Japan and, and America is how densely populated, uh, populated Japan is. So that the uh, there's a tremendous um, press for, for, for space. So the, the average um, home that a, a Japanese would, would live in as opposed to an American is some, somewhere like half the size. So, so most of Japanese architecture has been a, a question of how do, you, how, do you, how do you live? How do you live in a dense, really dense uh, environment where buildings don't have any exterior present presence like the, the 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 white buildings that i showed at the end of the of my slides they really need to be in a field to be to be understood whereas the japanese architects uh, or japanese buildings you, you never really sense the full exterior of the building because it's always jammed in next to other buildings and the, the buildings pen, penetrate each other and they become like a more like a beehive than um, like an individual field uh, with um, prairie dogs sticking their head out of their own identifiable mound. So that's that's. I mean, there are many differences, but that's that's uh, uh, that's sort of the starting point, I think. Our next question comes from Marlon. Hi. Good morning. Oh, Marlon, I, I, Marlon, did you choose that? Did you, you and Peter decide to match colors this morning? 
That's very uh, impressive. I just wanted to call that out. You called me at five this morning. <laughs> uh, wait, did, did I go? Um, uh, I learned that your career has given you the opportunity to travel and experience the architecture of other parts of the world. Has traveling impacted the way in which your building design style has evolved over the, the years? Uh, yes, yes. Um, um, I think that understanding the differences uh, between different buildings and different cultures and having been built at different times is critical to understanding what we are doing and what our role is. Um, it's, it's absolutely imperative to travel and, um, and, and we get out of our own kind of beehive because uh, look, looking within has tremendous limitations. Um, and we miss the, we miss the, the often miss the big picture, which can only be seen from above. So we, we need to, to, to go from the macro level to the micro level in, with, within different communities to, to understand what the, what the real issues are and, and how things, when we're creating new things, to, to understand the deep meaning of these things, rather than just like that last picture I showed. Um, had no, no meaning whatsoever except a, a kind of romantic notion of what an old building would look like. And it, it was about two inches deep glued on the front of this building. It's also a way of, of preserving false understandings. It, 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 it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not real. I, I guess what most architects are looking for is, is the, the real essence of what we're doing. That's the real expression of who we are and what we are. That, that, that seems to me to be the, the uh, most satisfying way to live. Although it's, the, it's a difficult way to live to live with the knowledge of where we are, where our weaknesses are, um, is harder to live than some fake notion of um, a, a false memory of what America w w it was like, for, for example. The, the, what, what do we call our, our houses? Ranch houses. We all wanna live in a ranch house. Um, that's ridiculous. We don't live on the ranch. But, but we try to maintain that false image, which has also all kinds of bad implications. It, it has to do with, we don't live in a ranch, we, li we live in, the, in, in a kind of a beehive. And you can't, you can't have um, you know, a, a thousand ranches living in a beehive, because the idea of the ranch is that, that there's, only, there's only one ranch house on the prairie. Uh, it's, it's, it's just the, the, the kind of common ridiculous notion that this country is, is uh, coping with today. And, and that's how those kinds of notions can be and are expressed in architecture. And, and the, what our civilization and our country is all about can be seen and can be expressed. When you, when you look at, at the way we build our buildings and, and the kinds of images that we that we want to live with. That's all so fascinating. Thank you so much for that. Uh, our next question comes from Jimmy. Hi, good morning. Good morning. What are the skills and qualities a person needs to possess in order to have what it takes to become an art architect? That's a really great question. I like that one because we, we, we have two sides to our brain. Um, and one, one side is, is, is expressed in who we are in, in terms of, in, in terms of um, being sensitive to shape and form and color. Uh, and then the other side of our brain is sensitive to, to language and words and um, and they're, they're, they're very different. Um, I think that most architects just have this, this kind of common, um, I, don't know, I don't know whether it's, it's a, a positive thing or a negative thing, it doesn't matter, it is what it is. Most architects have this 
they've always liked making things. They've always liked color. They've always liked to draw those kinds of things. It's just common. And, and the, other, the other type, if you might say so, is loves to read and write and um, has great memory and, and uh, deals with the world in those terms. Um, I, I know that I'm, I know where I fit. Uh, I'm, I'm definitely into shapes, forms, color. Um, and and although, I, although I can read, I, reading is, is not my thing. Uh, I, my wife, on the other hand, is the exact opposite. She is um, just absorbs books and, not, and, and ideas that, that are expressed that way. But when she gets in her car, she can't, she can't drive to the supermarket because she can't remember the streets and how she got there. She, she has no three dimensional, no, no, no sense of space or form at all. So, um, so, so that's, that's one aspect of, of becoming an architect. It is not a technical, it, it, people think that if there's a lot of math and there's a lot of um, you know, science, science type thing, it's not the case. Uh, if you, except for that little bit on the, on the uh, that I talked about, about the structure and the, and the um, rebar, there, there's very, very little pure math. All the things I was talking about is what architecture is really about. Are and, oh, I'm sorry. Many, many ways of being an architect. Many, many, many ways of, of dealing with the environment and the built world. Wonderful. Uh, our next question comes from Tracy. Hello, good morning. Hi, Tracy. In your biography, it states that you lecture widely on the need for architects to change the profession. And in what way do you believe that the profession should change? The way, it's, the, way the profession is organized now, the architect makes drawings uh, makes a kind of a manual for, for a building to be built and then somebody else builds it. And what I'm advocating for is for the architect who designs the manual also to do the, to actually build the building, be the, be the contractor as well as the architect. Uh, that's that's um, before the late 19th century, there was not the distinction between architects who draw and, and, and builders or makers who, 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 who build. There were no architects uh, as such. Um, the architects got together then and they wanted to improve, improve their social status. They didn't want to be seen as tradesmen. Uh, they, they wanted to be seen in, in fancy clothes with the foulards, the, 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 the um, society of, of the days. This is my pejorative view of, of architects. So, so take it with a grain of salt, but it's true. Um, I don't see how you can design buildings if you're not intimately involved in the construction of them. That, it's just that simple. We wanna be mindful of your time, Peter. Do you have time for two more questions? Sure. Great, all right, our next one comes from Sochikitzali. Hi, good morning. Can you tell us about what it feels what it feels like for an architect to see your building designs come to life? Um, it is um, it is I apologize for the phone. Um, it's it's a it's a it's what makes it all worthwhile, actually, and, and it's the ultimate learning experience because when you um, when you design something and you you have it in your mind and you have it on paper, it, it's it, it, the, it's more than curiosity to, to want to know whether your your ideas were right or not, and you want to learn because it's always different. Every building is different. The the the, the kinds of things that you you begin to really truly understand or enhanced uh, by every new situation. So it's like a super learning experience and um, it's, the, it's the greatest thrill. Um, next to actually doing something like this, seeing, seeing your building in, in, in use 
uh, that that is the greatest thrill of seeing a building in use and seeing people enjoying it and having the people have have sense sensibilities and um, insights that they might not have had had they not lived in the building. That's the that's the trip. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll go to our final question now, if that sounds okay. Um, we'll go to Andre. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, I would like to thank you for being our virtual speaker, for being part of our virtual speaker series. My question for you is, when did you decide that you wanted to study architecture and what inspired this career path? So when I was at the, in college, I had no idea what an architect was. Um, I, I had the same understanding of what an architect was and, or does as you guys do, even when I was in college. And then I had this teacher who talked about architecture in, in, in ways that just really inspired me. Um, he turns out to have been one of the one of the most fabulous teachers in in his era, um, and, and also at the same time, at the, where I was at school, they had courses that 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 existed and were developed in Germany in the Bauhaus, um, very 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 famous school um, that really led to most of, of modern architecture. Uh, so I was at, at, at a college where they I, I was lucky enough to be at a place where um, these kinds of things existed. Uh, it's one of the advantages to going to a, a large university when you go to college, because you you get uh, you, you you get positions from from different people and different aspects of of, of life that you don't get in a smaller place. You, you don't get the nurturing in a, in, a, in a larger place, but then you also don't get the breadth of, of um, opportunity that you do in a larger place. So I think that, I think that answers it. And you know, once I, once I took one course in architecture, I was, I, I was, I was, I was totally, totally committed. That was it. From that day, it was like, my God, this is fantastic. This is fun. I'm going to have fun the rest of my life. And that's the ultimate joy is being able to have something that you truly enjoy doing, you know, whether, and it, whether it's teaching or whether it's science or whether it's architecture or whether it's, um, you know, being, uh, being on the front line of, uh, of uh, um, medical re research or whether it's being on the front line of medical um, practice, um, finding, finding that thing that is truly, you're truly passionate about is the greatest thing you can do in life. It makes, and in terms of work, I think I never knew where, I don't, I don't know what work is because it's fun. I, mind you, it's, it's very hard and it's tough, but, but uh, work is when you have to look at the clock and say, I've got two hours and 40 minutes left. I can't wait, you know, I, gotta, I can't stand this. That's work, but you can be working for two, like doctors in the, in the, in the uh, operating room. They may work for you know, 48 hours straight, but to them, it's not work. It's, uh, it's, it's the passion of doing what they do. So that's what we're striving for. We're striving to find each one of us what we're passionate about. So that's your search. Thank you so much, Peter. That's such an inspiring way to, to end our morning. And we're so glad you found architecture. Otherwise, we wouldn't have our incredible building. <laughs> so thank you so much. We'll end this morning with Tracy leading one moment of silence just to take in everything you shared with us. And then Ivan will offer some final reflections. One, two, three.
One, two, three. Thank you, Tracy. And as Ms. Warren said, thank you, Peter Gluck. I think, Peter, you saw from uh, the profound and uh, lean and, and concise and lapidary questions that people were really excited to engage with you. As always, I, I learn every time I, I talk to you, I still carry the image of the sumo wrestler on top of the concrete plank mm -hmm. um, in, in our mission, Peter, I think you know that there's a phrase that, that says that we want uh, to teach people like Marlon, who's got the same style you're wearing this morning, we want to teach them to um, be able to adapt to change and create and share lives of deep meaning. And you embody that. Not only do you do that, but you give us a space where we can create and share lives of deep meaning, dynamic virtue, and as you end with the, at the end of your speech, and, and it, it's the heart of it, um, a life of transcendent joy. Um, so I'm thankful, as Anna said, that you found this profession. And then we found transcendent joy here in your building beyond um, what we experienced um, in, in our prior building. It always was a wonderful place, but you made our search for meaning and passion uh, even more, more beautiful. And I just want to thank you for being our speaker, but thank you for, for being you and following this path that uh, brings so much light and life to, to people like us. Any final words for us, Peter? No, it's just, um, it's, it's just, I, I'm just so delighted that th there's so many people who would love to, to, to um, fill this role and talk to to, to, to kids like this because, because we never get a chance and this, this seems like it's like it's an opening in the wall to, to get into into your heads and your lives which which are only going to enhance what we do but uh, but be, be really positive um, opportunities for us I, I think that the, the, the lecture program, is more for the people that come than it is for the kids there. So everyone that, that we've had um, suggested talk there has, has it has opened their eyes, and it's been really a positive uh, a positive thing to them. Probably more so than than it was in reverse for the kids. So I well, think as you as you go further with this, I think you should think in those terms. Well, that's kind of you to say, Peter, but really your, your presence and your words are, are, are really um, a wonderful, wonderful inspiration. And I hope I, I see you soon. Thank you, Bethia, for, uh, for, for managing the, the technolo technology behind Peter's presentation and have a beautiful weekend. And I'm gonna have a beautiful several hours in this beautiful building at the 309 on the 103. Great. Stress those rebar. <laughs> I am. I eat Chef Jonah's lunch. That I'm testing it every every day. Oh, there's Bethia in the spotlight. The, you have one of <laughs>